type of seminar at the Hellenic Centre. Um, we're very fortunate indeed to have two excellent speakers who really need no introduction, but I will make some introductory comments and, of course, introduce them. Um, the title for today's seminar, the Lobby for Cyprus seminar, is Are by Communalism and by Zonalism Redundant Concepts in the Multi-Ethnic Cyprus of Today? Now, you, you probably realise that some, one of our speakers is not yet here, uh, Dr. Giliagidis is on his way. Um, he did say he would have to be a little bit late because he is lecturing at his university. But I'm, I'm sure that those of you who heard Glaucus uh, Kiriakidis speak will know it's worth, definitely worth waiting for him to arrive. Now, Professor Gufudakis will um, speak on the Bizonal Federation model and the destruction of the Republic of Cyprus. Uh, again, we are very privileged and honoured that um, Professor Gufudakis is here with us. Professor Gulakis is Rector Emeritus at the University of Nicosia, Dean Emeritus of the College of Arts and Sciences at Indiana University, Purdue University at Fort Wayne, and Professor Emeritus of Political Science as well. He is author and editor of numerous books and has written more than 95 journals, articles and book chapters published worldwide. His books include National Aggression and Violation of Human Rights, The Case of Turkey and Cyprus, Cyprus, a Contemporary Problem in Historical Perspective. He also co-authored with Dr. Kyriakides um, The Case Against the Annan Plan. Before the Annan Plan um, was put forward in 2004, it was published by, by Lobby for Cyprus. So again, we're very honoured to have him with us. Before we start, I'd like to say a few introductory remarks and a little bit about Lobby for Cyprus. What do we stand for? We're a non-political human rights NGO. We were formed in 1992, and since our inception we've campaigned against the invasion, occupation, ethnic, ethnic cleansing and destruction of the cultural heritage of, of our island, of 37% of the Republic of Cyprus, which is occupied by Turkey. Lobby believes that being independent and non-aligned has enabled us to maintain our policies and allowed us to, to evaluate freely the developments concerning Cyprus without any external political forces. We were founded by a number of UK-based Cypriot refugee organisations, Ayas Ambrosios, Angla Ganthu, Labidos and Garabas, and a number of individuals as well, uh, including our former coordinator, Kiriago Shistodulu. Now that we all, we all and they all believe that any settlement cannot and should not legitimise Turkey's illegal occupation of the northern part of Cyprus. What do we stand for? We stand for and, and campaign around the three R's. The removal of all Turkish troops, repatriation of all colonists, and the return of all refugees to their homes and lands without restriction or precondition. We strongly believe that any settlement that does not guarantee the implementation of these minimum principles will lead to a bizonal confederation, i.e. two distinct and separate bodies and self-governing bodies on the island of Cyprus. We will never accept a settlement at lobby that will create an apartheid state in Cyprus. We campaign for all Cypriots. Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots, but we are made up of Greek Cypriot um, refugee associations. We want a united Cyprus that's in line with international law. One of the issues that always comes up and why we have the seminar tonight is what does this mean, a bizonal, bicommunal federation? What, what, what do the Greek Cypriots think it means? What do the Turkish Cypriots think it means? Where are we at the moment? Um, well, the positives are that the Republic of Cyprus had what many agreed was a highly successful six-month presidency. That began in July 2012. So that was certainly a positive. There were obviously negatives. The banking and financial crisis that took place in the Republic, uh, as was taking place in other parts of Europe, particularly Greece, Spain, Italy. Lost in all of this, of course, was the fact, well, some would say it's lost, 
that the negotiations between the Turkish Cypriot leader and the President of the Republic of Cyprus, uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that Dr. Giriagilis is here with us now, so uh, thank you, uh, Kleakos. Just made it in time. Well done. Thank you. Um, of course, the negotiations reached a stalemate in May uh, last year, um, and there were a number of other factors which converged at the same time. I mentioned the Republic's presidency. Of course, <coughs> Mr. Erdogan, the Turkish Cypriot leader, decided not to meet President Christophus during the, the EU presidency, no doubt, under instruction from uh, Turkey. Another positive was the discovery of natural gas deposits off the southern Cypriot coast. And also we've got, of course, the, the national elections coming up in February in the Republic of Cyprus. So all these issues converged and are converging. Negotiations may start after the elections, but Mr. Rogula's recent statement, again, does not give us much hope. He apparently said, following the Republic of Cyprus ele elections, the negotiation table will be set up under the roof of the state established by the TRNC. So with that contextualisation, I will hand over to Professor Kufunagis first. Thank you. Can I? Yes, of course. As I said, this reminds me of Baptist revivals, you know, where you have one guy that comes out to work up the crowd and get it ready for the next speaker, who's the real speaker for the evening. <laughs> so, in this kind of context, here I am trying to rally up the crowd, get it ready, and then you're going to hear the real speech from my colleague and friend, Claire Pastrina-Gilis. I would like to thank you for coming tonight. I would like to thank Theo Theodoro, who, uh, of course, is not here. He's in Nigeria. He called from Nigeria this morning. He said, I'm sorry, I cannot be present because, etc." Well, reality, traveling, I came in from Athens this morning, too. Uh, so, uh, thanks to the Lobby for Cyprus for the invitation, and also I'm grateful that Claire Kostiliakidis is with me tonight, because he and I, back in 2004, about this time of the year, had gotten together to speak against the Anand plan, and uh, here we are again, uh, nine years later, doing the same thing, because unfortunately, those of you who believe in the resurrection, this is a case of a resurrection that we have had again in the last few months. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, I'm also pleased to see Fanula Yiru here in the audience because she has also devoted years and years of her life uh, on the Cyprus issue, working the British documents, finding out details as to who did what, when, and how. She and I are in a regular email dialogue on these issues. I'm pleased that she took the time to be here tonight. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in a free and uh, decisive, I would say, referendum back in 2004, uh, the Greek Cypriot community, because the communities voted at that particular time, uh, turned down a plan intended to destroy the Republic of Cyprus. That was the so-called Anan Plan version 5 that was presented in cooperation with the United Kingdom, because it was really drafted by the United Kingdom, supported by the United States, promoted by Kofi Annan, and here we are again discussing the same thing. But in a free and decisive referendum in, 19, uh, in 2004, 76% of the Greek Cypriot population rejected a plan that would have legitimized the partition of Cyprus legitimized Turkey's intervention rights in Cyprus, would have expanded Britain's and Turkey's rights over a sovereign member of the EU. If you have questions on that, I'll be happy to discuss it, because one of the, if you have a plan of 9,000 pages, 9,000 plus pages, they had a little chapter uh, expanding on the new rights that the United Kingdom would get in Cyprus years after independence. And that included the territorial waters, 
the subsoil of Cyprus and the continental shelf of Cyprus, things that the 1960 agreements never included. But of course, who reads 9,000 plus pages? And in the propaganda of the UN, these things never, ever surfaced. Also, the Annan plan would have deprived all Cypriots, Greek and Turkish, of human rights guaranteed under the European Convention. And I'm going to come back to that point because it's very important. And finally, would have legitimized the demographic changes brought about by the influx of illegitimate, uh, Ill illegal, basically, Turkish mainland settlers who now outnumber the native Turkish Cypriots by something like 3 to 1 ratio, uh, and that's a conservative number. The Greek Cypriots on April 24, 2004, wisely and freely rejected the so-called bizonal, bicommunal federation model as the basis for the resolution of the Cyprus problem. But despite the overwhelming rejection of this unprecedented constitutional construct, Stylinica and Otoleo Syndagmatiki Sophistia. Oops, just to get excited. Uh, we, we were once, we were now once more confronted with a resurrected Annan plan in an even more dangerous version of the so-called bizonal bicommunal federation. It is the result of nearly four years of talks by the outgoing administration of President Christophias and the Turkish Cypriot leadership under the auspices of the UN Special Representative Alexander Downer, a man that I knew very well when he was Australia's foreign minister once upon a time. And at that time, given that he was getting elected in Adelaide, uh, which has a city that has a heavy Greek and Cypriot base, his views on the Cyprus problem were very different than those that he's promoting today. But that's, of course, for history to decide some other day. Anyway, as it happened in previous rounds of UN-sponsored talks since 1975, the burden of concessions has fallen on the Greek Cypriots without any Turkish reciprocity. And I want to emphasize the words Turkish reciprocity because the leadership of the Turkish Cypriot community, whether under Rolf Demtas, Mr. Talat or Mr. Erolu, has failed to present its own proposals for the so-called reunification of Cyprus. Instead, Turkish Cypriot leaders have admitted that their negotiating proposals have been drafted and approved by Ankara. The accumulation of Greek Cypriot negotiating errors, and there are many, includes, but is not limited to, one, the acceptance of the so-called bizonal, bicommunal federation as the basis for the resolution of the Cyprus problem, without a clear understanding of what these abstract constitutional terms entailed. Second, the failure to demand zero-based negotiations, even though Turkey repeatedly changed the basis for these talks. You know, the talks would start, they would fail, then the US and Britain would come back and say, why don't you go back again, give them something new, make one more concession, we'll get them to the negotiating table. And the history, of course, repeated itself. This is the salamization of the Cyprus proper problem. You know how you take it big piece of salami and you keep slicing it, now we are left with a tail, the very end of the salami, the salamization of the Cyprus problem. Well, we're not cooking tonight, but that's okay. Uh, the reality is that what we have seen is the failure then to demand zero-based negotiations, even though Turkey repeatedly changed the basis for the talks. For example, two, two examples. In 1983, Turkey created the so-called Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus in the occupied part of Cyprus and changed the whole nature of the discussion because from that point on, it began talking about a two-state solution. And the TRNC, in quotation marks, was the beginning of promoting that particular solution. A second point, uh, Mr. Demtas and his Rump Parliament in 1994 rejected the idea of federation as the basis for the constitutional resolution of the Cyprus problem and said very clearly that from now on we're talking about a confederation. The Turks understood very clearly the difference between federation and confederation. I'll come back to that point in a minute. 
the deadlock negotiations, of course, went on. Turkey took for granted all the Greek Cypriot concessions and simply asked for more. And that's why we're in the deadlock that we're in today. Uh, another point that I should talk about is that the Greek Cypriots, in many ways, helped downgrade the Cyprus problem from one of invasion, occupation, and continuing violations of internationally guaranteed human rights to that of a bicommunal problem in need for a constitutional resolution. The fourth problem, that the continuation of the talks in the last couple of years went on, the, 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 the talks continued in the last couple of years despite threats from Ankara to use force against the Republic of Cyprus if the Republic of Cyprus proceeded with the exploration and exploitation of its own natural resources in its own exclusive economic zone under international treaties that are a part of EU law. The three treaties on the law of the sea are part of EU law. This is what the Republic of Cyprus did. It acted under that law. Turkey, a prospective member of the EU, refuses to acknowledge the legality of basic laws of the EU and threatened to use force against Cyprus if it went to uh, the, the, if it proceeded with the idea to uh, explore and eventually exploit uh, its own resources in its own continental, I'm sorry, in its own exclusive economic zone. Now, as if this was not enough, the previous Minister of Commerce in Cyprus was even willing to promise Turkey and the Turkish Cypriots a share of Cypriot uh, mineral wealth despite Turkey's threat of force. These promises, of course, have now been adopted by Alexander Downer and British diplomats in order to secure a more cooperative behavior by Turkey and its Turkish Cypriot surrogates. A fifth problem in the negotiations that the outgoing government of the Republic of Cyprus, along with Alexander Downer, promoted the United Nations mythology, and that's all it is, that in contrast to the negotiations of the 2002-2004 period, the current talks were Cypriot owned and Cypriot directed. This was, of course, intended to show that the resurrected Annan plan did not originate with the UN, but from the two Cypriot communities. So, under the direction of Alexander Downer, the Greek Cypriots continued the policy of concessions. And to the proof of that, take a look at a 26 page document that outlined the Greek Cypriot positions in, the, new, in the, nego the, the negotiations of the last three years, and the so-called convergence document that is dated uh, 29 January 2012, that shows exactly where and how far the Greek Cypriot positions have moved compared to what the Greek Cypriot positions have been in the past. Of course, these two documents, and these are documents of the Republic of Cyprus, show the total disregard for the outcome of the 24 April 2004 referendum. They show the new and tragic concessions that have been made, which include, among others, the acceptance of the so-called four freedoms for Turkish nationals in the new Republic of Cyprus. Turks coming from the mainland of Cyprus would have equal rights, political, social, cultural, and everything in the Republic of Cyprus, assuring, of course, uh, the Turkification of Cyprus, basically. And finally, uh, there was an attempt to attribute the new Greek Cypriot concessions to Mr. Christophias' uh, predecessors. Uh, this has been a very funny sort of time period in Cypriot politics, where the government says, we're not at fault. We're not at fault for the economic crisis. We're not at fault for what happened in Marie. And of course, we're not at fault that we brought down the negotiating cards of Cyprus because we didn't do it, the others did it. From Macarius to now, everybody else at fault. Therefore, we have not done anything more than simply continue concessions. Well, this may have been true in the case of pa Tazos Papadopoulos, who inherited the concessions of all his predecessors, Pleiades, and before that. But in contrast to President uh, Papadopoulos, Christophius went to the negotiation table with a, a new mandate. And the new mandate that he had in his hands was the outcome of the 2004 referendum. And he blew it. 
And now we're back to square one because Downer, of course, is asking to return back to the talks where the talks ended uh, a few months ago. I have to give credit to Turkey for pursuing a consistent policy on the Cyprus problem because Turkish policy maintains, one, that the Cyprus problem was solved in 1974, meaning the invasion and the occupation of 38% of the Republic. Second, that the creation of the so-called TRNC in 1983 has set the foundation for the two-state solution on Cyprus under a confederation. This solution assures not only the partition of Cyprus, but also Turkey's control over all the island. Another point, there is a demand to end the so-called Turkish Cypriot isolation, even though this so-called isolation is a direct outcome of the Turkish invasion and continued occupation. But it is used today by Turkey to bring about the de facto recognition of the occupied areas. And that's exactly what that process of so-called lifting uh, the, uh, the embargoes and all that is, isolation intends to do. And of course, Turkey demands that uh, continuously the Turkish troops remain on the soil of an EU member with expanded intervention rights even after the resolution of the Cyprus problem. Turkey has been clear and consistent. The problem is with the Greek Cypriot side, and it has not been, and has been fluctuating from A to Z and accepting things that it rejected before and accepts now. Nobody takes them seriously. As anticipated, the latest round of talks ended in deadlock, and I'll comment very briefly on this issue. One, the acceptance of talks on the basis of the Anglo American model of the bizonal bicommunal federation amounts to the acceptance of the legitimized partition of Cyprus that Richard Holbrook demanded of the Greek Cypriots in his mission to Cyprus in May of 1998. I do have that document, his talking points, in my own files. That's one of the precious items that I have. A second point, the bizonal bicommunal federation model is an unprecedented constitutional construct created by, British, by the British, promoted by the Anglo-American diplomacy, especially after the 1977 Clark Clifford visit to Cyprus. It is an unprecedented constitutional construct that has now been incorporated in UN Security Council resolutions drafted by British diplomats at the Security Council. All the resolutions on Cyprus begin at the British mission at the UN. Then the, U the Americans get into it, and then the final product is produced every time they renew the mandate of uh, the UN peacekeeping force and they include all the various points, the political resolution of Cyprus. Now, it is somewhat ironic that while during the Cold War, England and the United States fought hard to keep the Cyprus issue off the UN agenda, since the end of the Cold War, the two countries have relied on the UN Security Council to promote the bizonal bicommunal federation model as the only legitimate solution of the Cyprus problem. A third point, supporters of the so-called bizonal bicommunal federation have not read carefully Lord David Honey's book on Cyprus. In a most cynical manner, David Honey describes how he and his American counterparts relied on the words, are, the words are wonderful, constructive ambiguity, okay? Uh, with the intent to pretty much mislead the Greek Cypriots about their real intentions and the real meaning of the proposals that they were submitting on the Cyprus negotiations. The bizonal bicommunal federation construct is unprecedented, it is dysfunctional, it is divisive, and it is discriminatory. This is why Alexander Downer is coming back to do the same thing that was rejected in 2004. In reality, the bizonal bicommunal model promotes a confederation of two autonomous states on Cyprus. None of the versions of this model presented by Kofi Annan back then and now by Downer and Ban Ki-moon uh, provide for the hierarchy of laws that, are, that is normally found in federal constitutions. Federal constitutions in most critical areas give primacy to federal law. In the case of the model promoted for Cyprus, as in all confederations, 
The central government is a subordinate governmental unit to the two constituent states. This is what they're trying to do today in Cyprus. Finally, and most importantly, the bisonal bicommunal federation, in any of the models presented until now, is in direct violation of the European Convention on Human Rights, a treaty which is the fundamental law of the European Union. This unprecedented constitutional construct is based on discrimination on the basis of ethnicity, language, and religion. This is explicitly prohibited under Article 14 of the European Convention. And needless to say, both Turkey and the Republic of Cyprus have ratified the European Convention. As a law-abiding member of the EU, the Republic of Cyprus must not and cannot accept a constitutional construct that violates the very essence of the rule of law and democracy, period. Where do we go from here, especially when Cyprus is headed to presidential elections less than a month from now? Two of the three major presidential candidates talk in terms of a bisonal, bicommunal model with, quote, a proper content. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there is no proper content in a discriminatory model intended to destroy a 53-year-old republic. This model can only lead to the Turkification of Cyprus, to the partition of Cyprus, and to the violation of the human rights and fundamental rights of all Cypriots under the European Convention. Pure and simple. You are here tonight because of your concern about the future of the Republic of Cyprus and of Cypriot Hellenism. Do not be fooled by the, the sirens promoting the bisonal by communal federation model as the model for the reunification of Cyprus. This model will destroy the Republic of Cyprus and formalize its partition. This is the latest manifestation of the plans that have been floating around on Cyprus since the spring of 1964. First with the NATO plan in February, March of 64, the Atchison plans of summer and fall of 64. Since then, these are the plans that have dominated how to destroy the Republic of Cyprus. In 2004, Cyprus avoided its own destruction. The challenge today is to do it also now. Remember that there can be no just and viable solution that violates the rule of law and democracy. If Cypriots do not stand for this very basic principle, no one else will. Freedom, democracy, and the rule of law are fundamental principles required for the survival of Cypriot Hellenism. Cypriot Hellenism will not survive by appeasement, by concessions to Turkish expansionism, and by attempting to please foreign powers. No self-respecting country would accept to destroy itself to please third parties. So if they wouldn't do it, why should we expect the Cypriots to do that? Very plain, simple, rational question. With a sense of responsibility then for the future of Cypriot Hellenism, reject all plans presented under that unprecedented constitutional construct of the so-called bisonal bicommunal federation, a construct that mortgages the future of Cypriot Hellenism to Turkey's neo-Ottomanist ambitions. Thank you very much.